Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. During the summer of 1609, Samuel de Champlain attempted to form better relations and alliances with the local First Nations tribes, including Wendat Hurons, Algonquins, and Montagne, who lived in the area of the St. Lawrence River. These tribes sought Champlain's help in their war against the Haudenosaunee, also known as the Iroquois Confederacy, League, or Five Nations. The founder of New France set off with his men to explore the Rivière des Iroquois, now known as the Richelieu River, and became the first known European to lay eyes on and map one of the continent's majestic bodies of water, named Lake Champlain in his honor. On July 29, 1609, Somewhere in the area near Ticonderoga and Crown Point in Upper New York State, a battle took place that had a significant effect on relations between the French and the Iroquoian Mohawks. Samuel de Champlain and the Iroquois Champlain gazed upon the scene before him with wondering eyes. In front was a circular barricade composed of trunks of trees, boughs, and matted twigs, behind which the Iroquois stood like tigers at bay. In the edge of the forest around were clustered their yelling foes, screaming shrill defiance, yet afraid to attack, for they had already been driven back with severe loss. Their hope now lay in their white allies, and when they saw Champlain and his men, a yell arose that rent the air, and a cloud of winged arrows was poured into the woodland fort. The beleaguered Iroquois replied with as fierce a shout, and with a better aimed shower of arrows. At least Champlain had reason to think so, for one of these stone-headed darts split his ear and tore a furrow through the muscles of his neck. One of his men received a similar wound. Furious with pain, Champlain, secure in his steel armor, rushed to the woodland fort, followed by his men, and discharged their arquebuses through its crevices upon the dismayed Mohawks, who, wild with terror at this new and deadly weapon, flung themselves flat upon the earth at each report. At each moment the scene of war grew more animated. The assailing Indians, yelling in triumph, ran up under cover of their large wooden shields, and began to tug at the trees of the barricade, while other of them gathered thickly in the bushes for the final onset. And now from the forest depths came hurrying to the scene a new party of French allies, a boat's crew of fur traders, who had heard the firing and flown with warlike eagerness to take part in the fight. The bullets of these new assailants added to the terror of the Iroquois. They writhed and darted to and fro to escape the leaden missiles that tore through their frail barricade. At a signal from Champlain, the Allies rushed from their leafy covert, flew to the breastwork, tore down or clambered over the bows, and precipitated themselves into the fort while the French ceased their firing and led a party of Indians to the assault on the opposite side. The howls of defiance, screams of pain, deafening war-whoops, and dull sound of deadly blows were now redoubled. Many of the Iroquois stood their ground, hewing with tomahawks and war-clubs, and dying not unrevenged. Some leaped the barrier and were killed by the crowd outside. Others sprang into the river and were drowned. Of them all, not one escaped, and at the end of the conflict but fifteen remained alive prisoners in the hands of their deadly foes, destined victims of torture and flame. On the next day a large party of Hurons arrived and heard with envy the story of the fight, in which they were too late to take part. The forest and river shore were crowded with Indian huts. Hundreds of warriors assembled, who spent the day in wild war dances and songs, then loaded their canoes and paddled away in triumph to their homes, without a thought of following up their success, and striking yet heavier blows upon their dreaded enemy. Even Champlain, who was versed in civilized warfare, made no attempt to lead them to an invasion of the Iroquois realm. He did not dream of the deadly reprisal which the now-defeated race would exact for this day of disaster. Of the further doings of Champlain we shall relate but one incident, a thrilling adventure which he tells of his being lost in the interminable woodland depths. Year after year he continued his explorations, now voyaging far up the Ottawa, now reaching the mighty inland sea of Lake Huron, voyaging upon its waters, and visiting the Indian villages upon its shores, now again battling with the Iroquois, who, this time, drove their assailants in baffled confusion from their fort, now joining an Indian hunting party and taking part with them in their annual deer hunt. 
For this they constructed two lines of posts interlaced with boughs, each more than half a mile long and converging to a point where a strong enclosure was built. The hunters drove the deer before them into this enclosure, where others dispatched them with spears and arrows. It was during this expedition that the incident referred to took place. Champlain had gone into the forest with the hunters. Here he saw a bird new to him, and whose brilliant hue and strange shape struck him with surprise and admiration. It was, to judge from his description, a red-headed woodpecker. Bent on possessing this winged marvel, he pursued it, gun in hand. From bough to bough, from tree to tree, the bird flitted onward, leading the unthinking hunter step by step deeper into the wilderness. Then, when he surely thought to capture his prize, the luring wonder took wing and vanished in the forest depths. Disappointed, Champlain turned to seek his friends. But in what direction should he go? The day was cloudy. He had left his pocket compass at the camp. The forest spread in endless lines around him. He stood in helpless bewilderment and dismay. All day he wandered blindly, and at nightfall found himself still in a hopeless solitude. Weary and hungry, he lay down at the foot of a great tree and passed the night in broken slumbers. The next day he wandered onward in the same blind helplessness, reaching in late afternoon the waters of a forest pond shadowed by thick pines and with waterfowl on its brink. One of these he shot, kindled a fire, and cooked it, and for the first time since his misadventure, tasted food. At night there came on a cold rain, drenched by which the blanketless wanderer was forced to seek sleep in the open wood. Another day of fruitless wandering succeeded, another night of unrefreshing slumber. Paths were found in the forest, but they had been made by other feet than those of men, and if followed would lead him deeper into the seemingly endless wild. Roused by the new day from his chill couch, the lost wanderer despairingly roamed on, now almost hopeless of escape. Yet what sound was that which reached his ear? It was the silvery tinkle of a woodland rill, which crept onward unseen in the depths of a bushy glen. A ray of hope shot into his breast. This descending rivulet might lead him to the river where the hunters lay encamped. With renewed energy he traced its course, making his way through thicket and glen, led ever onwards by that musical sound, till he found himself on the borders of a small lake, within which the waters of his forest guide were lost. This lake, he felt, must have an outlet. He circled round it, clambering over fallen trees and forcing his way through thorny vines, till he saw, amid roots of alder bushes, a streamlet flow from the lakeside. This he hopefully followed. Not far had he gone before a dull roar met his ears, breaking the sullen silence of the woods. It was the sound of falling waters. He hastened forward. The wood grew thinner. Light appeared before him. Pushing gladly onward, he broke through the screening bushes and found himself on the edge of an open meadow wild animals its only tenants, some browsing on the grass, others lurking in bushy coverts. Yet a more gladsome sight to his eyes was the broad river, which here rushed along in a turbulent rapid, whose roar it was which had come to his ear in the forest glades. He looked about him. On the rocky river bank was a portage path made by Indian feet. The place seemed familiar. A second sweeping gaze. Yes, here were points he had seen before. He was saved. Glad at heart, he camped upon the river brink, kindled a fire, cooked the remains of his game, and passed that night, at least, in dreamless sleep. With daybreak he rose, followed the river downwards, and soon saw the smoke of the Indian campfires ascending in the morning air. In a few moments he had joined his dusky friends, greatly to their delight. They had sought him everywhere in vain, and now chided him gently for his careless risk, declaring that thenceforth they would never suffer him to go into the forest alone. While the Battle of Lake Champlain cowed the Iroquois and Mohawks for some years, they would later return to fight the French and Algonquin for the rest of the century. The Battle of Sorel occurred in June 1610, when Samuel de Champlain, supported by the Kingdom of France and his native allies, fought against the Mohawk people in New France at present-day Sorel Tracy, Quebec, my city of birth. Champlain's forces, armed with the arquebus long gun, engaged and defeated the Iroquois. The battle ended major hostilities with the Mohawks for 20 years. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. <laughs>